Today, uh, I had hoped to have the names and titles up there, so bear with me, uh, but uh, we have speakers that are particularly expert in learning and assessment, and how do you write tests that actually test what your students learn. Uh, our first speaker will be Jack Robinson, and he will be talking about how you decide on what assessments to use. Charlie Daniels from, uh, and Jack is from education, Charlie Daniels is from engineering and does a lot of online testing, which is always a very um, difficult task when you're dealing with, with distance students. And then finally we have two individuals from the Writing Center and, is it English? English. English department. Uh, uh, Tim Bostic and Matt Oliver. And they will be talking about assess writing assessments how to choose them, how to grade them, and all those critical kinds of issues. So uh, thank you them all for being here, and I'll turn the uh, program over to Jack Robinson. How do we go about deciding what kind of assessment method that we might use? All right. Um, and just sort of as a brief sort of overview, you know, let's talk about sort of like, what do we have for assessment methods? All right, we've got selected response. Which kind of you know includes things like multiple choice, true, false, matching, uh, fill in the blank, labeling diagrams, that kind of thing. And then another alternative is extended written response, which I think we're going to have a lot of discussion about later, uh, which maybe can be broken into sort of restricted or extended. Or we can talk about performance assessments, where we're looking at what someone does. Um, and then perform, uh, personal communication or informal assessment, which a lot of people don't think of these things as an assessment, but if we're also using assessment to gather information about students learning and understanding and to facilitate that, then things like questioning, interviews, discussions, those kinds of things can you know, contribute to student learning. We can also use oral exams you know, uh, to kind of get at somebody's actual performance in, in some kind of a uh, interactive dialogue, or you could actually include things like conferencing. So maybe a first question to start out with is, how do we decide? Yeah. Um, what's your experience been, or what do you do, if you're in certain academic areas, what kind of testing do we give? Anybody? What do we use? If you take a course in literature or history, what kind of an exam are you probably going to get as a student or give as an instructor? Some sort of written exam. Written exam, okay. Uh, psychology tends to do selective response, multiple choice, maybe sociology, science. Calculations. Science, math calculations, or in science doing some kind of an experiment, a lab experience, something, yeah, demonstrating, okay. Why? It's material. It's kind of like, it's what they did to me, <laughs> right? So I think that's what I'll probably do to other people, all right? Is that the way we should go about deciding even within each of those areas, like is that the kind of thing that we should be doing? Or maybe we ought to look at it in another way. So. Maybe it ought to be based on some notion of learning targets, which sort of begs the question, well, what do we have as learning targets typically? Is there some way we can kind of simply more look, look at that? Uh, well, what are the things we want people to learn? We want content knowledge, we want to know the material, and that might also include procedural knowledge, what to do and where to go to get things. Then instruction probably also involves, we're all into, we want to teach thinking and problem solving and reasoning. Right. So what's involved there? There's different kinds, working with material, uh, carrying it beyond just the content, organizing it, structuring, structuring it, figuring out how to go about you know, criticizing something, etc. Right. So there's reasoning and problem solving. And then we also want people to use or be able to produce something with knowledge, the knowledge they have, and using the reasons, different reasoning strategies, etc. So then we might be getting into actual products, performances, and those kinds of things. So given that, which method works best for what? Does one size fit all, to use a familiar cliche? So if we're talking about all these different kinds of things, what might be some alternative ways of going about assessing them, and what are the pros and cons of each one? Okay, so, uh, 
Select a response. We talked about the different kinds. What's involved in a select response? If you're a student and you have to take a test, uh, someone gives you a short answer, fill in the blank. Memory? Memory? Yeah, okay, not open book or not. All right, okay. What's involved in matching? Discrimination. Associative memory, right? That kind of stuff? Okay. What do you got to do with a true false? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Flip a coin, you get half of them right, right? <laughs> um, what's involved in a true false? It can be, re you know, just recall, right? Yeah. Or can you get beyond that? Yeah, yeah same, same with multiple choice. I feel like multiple choice and true and false, you can kind of understand based upon what the question is asking. Like a lot of times with true and false, if it ever says all or never, a lot of times it ends up being right. false, those sorts right. of things. Yeah, and there's, there's, there's ways of constructing them that tends to, you know, mm -hmm. trigger things. Uh, right, but you can certainly ask, you know, a true false is really in one way, it's a, it's a two alternative multiple choice. You know, you can use it for true or false, you can use it for agrees with the position, doesn't agree with the position, reflects this, this person's, you know, kind of style or that person's whatever. So you can get those kinds of things with it. Um, multiple choice, it's the workhorse, workhorse of standardized testing, et cetera. Why? It's easy to grade. Yeah. Huh? It's easy to grade. Easy to read? Grade? To grade. 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 Yeah, probably. Also, how versatile are they? They're really fairly versatile. You can get at content knowledge, etc. cetera. Uh, you can get at reasoning, or can you? Okay. Are there certain kinds of reasoning that probably are not gonna work very well for multiple choice? What would they be? Well, if you want somebody to take a body of understanding and make connections between it, put forth interpretations and support those, et cetera. Can you do that very well with a multiple choice item, where you really want the student to do the integrating, et cetera, okay? Now, if you want to say, can they do analytical thinking, can they do comparison contrast, can they classify things, uh, that kind of stuff, multiple choice works for that. Falls short when you really want people to do their own integration of some you know, idea or development of a plan or whatever. Okay, so. That's kind of like what those things seem to, you know, work for. Extended written response. Uh, I find it helpful to kind of break this into two things. You can't have an extended written response where somebody's response is going to be maybe a paragraph or two. Or you can have a response that's a page, page and a half or more. If you're doing those, which one, you know, what are you probably getting at? If someone's got to have a concise, you know, one or two paragraph statement about something, you're probably asking for what? Synthesis. Hmm? Synthesis. Synthesis. Uh, synthesis in a in a one or two. Content knowledge. Huh? Content knowledge. Maybe content, maybe application, maybe analysis. But if you want something to be synthesis and it really really map it out, explain, justify, etc. You, you know, then you're going to have, it's going to take more space and you're probably talking about something like an extended essay, which is more likely to get it maybe evaluation skills or the ability to synth synthesize and integrate things. Okay, so performance assessments. Again, restricted, extended, and I should say here, performance assessments, the idea there is that the focus is on the doing or being able to do. Okay, so restricted performance, as it says, probably for skills. And then if you're talking about extended performance assessments, the production of products and performances, um, that's going to be a more extended kind of project. You know. Both of these should probably involve rubrics or scoring guides. Something for, uh, uh, if you're at skills level, it's going to be maybe a checklist almost kind of thing. Um, can be a little more involved in that. Performance assessments, you may have to map out really extensive rubrics and actually work with them for students to learn how to, how to what, what's being asked for. Personal communication. We don't usually think of personal communication as assessment. 
But if we define assessment not only in terms of like I'm doing assessment to find out what someone's learned and give a grade, but I'm also using assessment some informatively to inform learning. And one of the key things to do that is that people get feedback on their understanding and the way they're thinking about something. Well, what happens if you, you know, in questioning and discussion in the classroom, or what can happen? We can do Q&A, which tends to be rote recall. <laughs> or we can do actually more open-ended or other kinds of formats of questioning where people make statements, provide reasons and discussions for it, et cetera. You know, and other people may be involved in that and dialogue with each other. Um, so they can also, as, as people are engaged in those things, they're actually getting a lot of feedback on their understanding the ways of thinking about things, or if you're even doing performance assessments and you want students to learn what these rubrics mean and what they look like, you know, using rubric-based dialogues, that kind of thing, can again support their developing of those skills. Okay, and um, conferences can be a form of assessment. Oral exams, certainly if it involves saying, doing something, um, use of a foreign language, that kind of stuff then you might, you know, want to do an uh, oral exam. Um, so, given that, which do we use for what? <laughs> if we're talking about knowledge targets, what would be, what would be a, probably a good or best choice? Hmm? Selected response. Selected could we all, what about extended written response? Would we use that for knowledge? Yes. Yeah. What's the difference? When would you want to use one versus the other? So you use application and knowledge? Application and use. Now you could get an application and use with both and get a reasoning with both, but what's the difference in terms of the kinds of reasoning? Pardon? I'm sorry. It's, in terms of knowledge, it's like rote memory if you're looking for just knowledge. But with extended written response, you're looking at how they analyze and how they um, apply uh, what they know. Okay. All right. All right. So that, all right. that's a deeper level right. of understanding, I would say. We, right. Now, we could be, but if we're asking for an area of understanding and we want to see whether they can integrate that, which one probably works better? Extended written response, okay. Why might we prefer multiple selected response? Couple of issues. You got a 50 minute test you're given. How many items can you ask? <laughs> if it's selected response. 100. <laughs> <laughs> you know, rule of thumb, rule of thumb. If you're sort of working at lower levels or, or recall type levels, 45 seconds to, to a minute per item. If you're working at thinking, problem solving, reasoning type levels, probably a minute and a half to two minutes per item. So if you're doing that and you've got a, a whole bunch of information to cover, like in a survey course, and you want to sample and get a uniform sample across those things, probably a multiple choice selection type item is going to allow you to do that better. Now you can try and do an essay to measure that, but you know, if you've been spending four weeks covering something, you've covered four or five or six chapters, and you say, discuss everything we've learned. Those are really bad items. <laughs> all sorts of research on, on validity, reliability, and stuff like that, it just shows it's, a, it's not good at all. So any general, oh, you know, tell me all you know type questions really don't work. They have to be focused and the, and the task has to be presented to the person. So if you're trying to sample a whole bunch of things, you can't get at, with an, get at it with an essay. Because a, a decent essay has got to be focused. So you're limited in terms of how much you can you know, get a sort of a broad sample. All right. So if it's integrated knowledge and understanding, et cetera, essays, if it's bits and pieces, and even different kinds of reasoning, then select response. OK. Performance assessments to get at knowledge? Is, is that where you actually have to 
project? Yeah, right. So if it's actually having to do, do something to a project, I mean, what's involved in a performance? Knowledge. You got to have knowledge. You got to have the types of, you know, of thinking, reasoning, critiquing, evaluating, et cetera. And then taking all that, you've got to turn that into some kind of performance or presentation or product. Okay. So is that really what we want to do with performance assessments? Okay. Likewise, if we're doing extended written response, do we want to use an essay test just to measure knowledge? It's kind of misusing or not using it, you know, what it would be good for. All right. All right. So, you know, so performance assessments, you can have part of that as a scoring in it, but the focus, you've got other ways of getting at that kind of stuff that are more efficient, work better, et cetera. Uh, personal communication, good idea. Great for interaction and learning. Uh, how well can you, how can you measure a whole class using personal communication? You can, but it's gonna be really time consuming. So if you've gotta measure, assess a whole bunch of people and you wanna do it in some sort of systematic, a uniform way, personal communication isn't gonna work. Dialogues and discussions can be great for informative, you know, formative understanding and developing it, but to kind of say, well, what does the student know? Where are they at at this point? Maybe not a good choice. All right, so probably for knowledge, selected response, extended written response. Reasoning? I have a comment about personal communication. Yeah. Uh, what about use of clickers? Isn't Using clickers? Yeah. yeah, right, yeah, right. Wouldn't that be a good way to, like, if you had a... Okay, yeah, and maybe I, Charlie can talk to that, no, no, speak no. to that, too. That might be, that's, yeah, it's a really good idea or suggestion. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, you could systematically do that with that. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, so maybe with the use of technology, you can do more things in the, in the personal communication area in terms of using it for assessment. All right, um, reasoning? Extended written response, selected response, certain kinds. Again, the difference is whether you're talking about things that really involve integration, synthesis, evaluation kinds of stuff versus other kinds of thinking type skills. Um, performance assessments? You might, you know, have people explain why and how they did something and you could get some that could be part of your rubric, all right, but it's probably not going to be the major, you know, major focus of it. All right, and personal communication, again, interactively as, a, as, a, as to learn and understand about what students are struggling with as well as what's working and what's not. Could work well for that. Probably not very useful for systematic unless we do something new. <laughs> okay, it's that, that, not that new now, I guess. Right. Okay, skills. Performance, right, that's sort of straightforward. All right, um, again, personal communication. Maybe with younger children, you know, early, early you know, but you're not, doesn't pertain to you, but, uh, or if people have limited, you know, communication skills, second language learners, et cetera, perhaps, okay. And products, again, performance assessment, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that covers um, let me get there. some additional guidelines. We've kind of talked about it. Uh, let me just bring up a couple of things here. If you try to write straightforward multiple choice items, okay, it's hard to get those to thinking levels because you become very dependent on verbal expression and you're triggering certain ways of thinking about things. A way to get at higher level thinking with selected response items and essays too is to use what's called database items where you present a scenario, graphs, charts, interpretation, diagnosis, and then ask one or several questions about it. Uh, a lot of times it might involve task analysis, figuring out all the kinds of things and decisions that people need to make. All right. So a way, you know, sort of way of enhancing the, the validity of those things and getting them to higher levels is to use database stuff. Another thing too, and this is what if you want to measure student thinking or learning, 
there's a key three-letter word involved, and it's the word new. If it ain't new, it ain't thinking. If our idea of teaching is that we not only want to convey information, but we want to see whether people can use it, we're really talking about people being able to transfer and use this, you know, the understanding or the principle or their idea in a newer novel situation. If it's not newer novel, it's not thinking. If we've gone over some piece of literature and said, well, you could interpret this according this way, this way, but this is the best way to interpret, and you ask for that on a test, you're not getting student thinking. So, database, using new ideas. Um, sell them to the item banks you're going to get with text major there. I probably find one in 30 or 40 texts that have halfway decent upper level items, and almost never do they have very many database items. Those you kind of have to make them. Okay, um, essays, we talked about interrelated bits of information. Uh, okay, uh, this is going to be covered later, but let me just give my spiel on it. Okay, uh, when we look at essay writing, you know, essays and essays is a form of assessment. There's a lot of problems with reliability on them. That is, whether or not we get consistent student performance or whether or not we get consistent scoring. A lot of that comes from somebody not articulating either to the student what's the thing you're supposed to be doing and how is it going to be assessed. And our, or it involves the instructor sitting down to grade papers, you know, with or without coffee and they haven't thought about what the response is supposed to look like, all right? So in both cases, whenever you write essay questions, you should have, have a question, and then the question needs to be focused. And some of the focus is going to be say, be sure that you cover these things, don't cover these things, and then the scoring. And I don't mean it's worth 20 points. I mean two points for this, four points for this, 10 for this, or 20%. 30%, whatever. But actually to map out the scoring, because if you don't do that, the student doesn't know how to direct their attention and what to address. Okay. And the scorer doesn't either. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, performance assessments. Not only do you need to kind of develop or have, have rubrics, all right, but students need practice with those things. If you're going to have people do extended involved performances, they need to know what it looks like and have practice doing it. Um, uh, kind of interesting piece of information. If you have students work with you in developing the rubrics for performance assessment, you get about a half a standard deviation increase in student learning just by having them involved in the rubric development. Not alone actually using it, practicing, and understanding what it means. Okay, uh, personal communication, as I mentioned, it's great for feedback. Um, most of us ask uh, Q&A questions somewhere in the order of one to three a minute, <laughs> uh, about 25% of the students actually respond four or five times more often than others. 30 or 40% never respond. So if you're using those to both teach, but if you're using it to gauge where the students are getting it, you know, you're, you, know you can be very misled, especially if you don't kind of sample broadly. Uh, another thing too, if you're using it to develop thinking, instead of asking questions like asking, a, initiating a question, getting a student response, and evaluating it correctly, whether it's correct or not, why not have students make statements, provide reasons, and explanations for their statement, and leave it more open-ended, okay? Um, I've actually, the, the, Actually, as I've looked at you know, the ideas and studies about quality, you know, questioning, stuff like that, one of the things that if you really got questioning working well in the classroom, you might say, well, what would that look like? If you really had questioning good, working well in the classroom and you structured the questions and you had people dialoguing, then you can actually prompt students to respond to each other. What would really be good is if students start responding, questioning, and discussing using the ideas of rubrics that they're supposed to be using and they kick you to the curb, you're not even in the conversation. Okay. If you have been able to get to that sometimes, but it's kind of like trying to map out and plan it. You know. So that tends to be a lot more useful and, and, and effective. And again, effects, the effect size on student learning is much greater for the SRE types of formulations rather than Q&A. Done. I probably went over. Uh, comments, questions? Thank you. I disagree with. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, great.
in case anyone came in late, th this is Matthew Oliver and Tim Bostick uh, from, as it says here, the Department of English, and um, talking about assessing learning through writing. Um, so just to reintroduce yourselves, my name is Tim Bostick. I'm an assistant professor in the English department. English education is my field, and I focus on the uh, teaching of writing, helping others uh, teach writing. And I'm Matt Oliver, director of composition studies for the Department of English here. So we're talking about using writing uh, for assessment, and uh, you know we discussed briefly formative assessments, response papers, short answer or short essay, reflective essays, and I don't want to... Um, talk about things that you already know, but there are some really great ways to get at this kind of formative writing and to assess it, and the key is to do so without overwhelming yourselves. As teachers, you'll have a lot of student work to look at. If they're not writing more than you can read, you're not giving them enough to write. One of the great ways I found to do this, uh, you know, and I, I thought of this during the last presentation, is having them use blogs within we have a blackboard feature with blogs but then they start writing and if they're blogs they write more and they comment to each other more because that's what they're used to doing in blogs when we want to um, get the kinds of formative assessment based on the what students are saying in low stakes writing assignments or get conversations going between them and so that we can sit on the curb um, we need to put them in the kinds of genres that they self-select when they're doing reflective kinds of writing. Uh, for years we used journals because that's what students used uh, as their writing of choice when they were doing writing for themselves to learn. Uh, but the blogs do enable us to do that in some really interesting ways. And, and just uh, as we move on, I just want to clarify something, and Dr. Robinson mm -hmm. brought it up, but this understanding about formative assessment and summative assessment and understanding that with formative assessment, that's really for both you and the student to make changes a, to, to assess what it is they don't know. In other words, if you've taught something and maybe you have students uh, go on to Blackboard and do some type of discussion and answering some discussion question, and you read through that and you realize, geez, I read every single one of these and none of the students mentioned X, which was a very important uh, element of this idea, then that tells you you probably didn't do a good job teaching it. And so it gives you the opportunity to go back and reteach. In the same way, if the students don't perform well on formative assessment, it means that they then have an understanding that they need to go back and do something else. So it acts as a um, as kind of a, a catch for both you and the, and the students. But um, here's some ways that you, uh, again, reasons for using it. It allows students to enter the academic conversation. It allows instructors to provide feedback in a low-risk environment. Because with formative assessment, you're often just giving them credit for doing it or a check that they, you know, like perhaps they have to post a certain number of times on a discussion board on Blackboard. And then you just give them checks for doing it. But it also gives them, it gives them a chance to talk about it in an environment where they know they're not going to be getting, you know, an A or a B or a C or a D, right? So that they can just, it's really their chance to kind of talk about what's interesting them about what they're doing. It also allows you, the instructor, to make pedagogical adjustments, again, as, as I said a second ago, and allows students to reflect on the process. I mean, one of the things, um, and Matt and I were trying to make sure that we, uh, when we put this together, that we were uh, addressing uh, different disciplines. If you've got an engineering, if you're an engineering professor and you're teaching a course and there's something that you know that the, some process of that the students need to understand, you could have them write about it. How would you apply this concept or this idea in this kind of setting and have them, again, they could just write a, a short response essay to it, they could do a, something on Blackboard, a discussion board, but then it gives you the chance to make sure that you've inculcated the processes that are important to your discipline into the students, and again in a low risk environment where they're not, they're not under the threat of failing. And then finally, it encourages uh, reflective practice under each discipline's guidelines. And you know, this is uh, Donald Schoen's work about the reflective practitioner, but I think it's becoming important for all of us. I mean, one of the things that I always tell my teacher ed candidates is that you know, the best, the most important thing that you can, disposition you can have is being a reflective practitioner. Because if you are reflective, that means that you're going to realize when you don't know enough about something and you need to go you know, brush up on your skills, but it also means that you're going to look at yourself before you just start blaming the students so that you kind of take a more holistic look. 
as we're gathering all of this formative data, say the students are doing blogs or they're doing some kind of discussion board or something that is causing them to write, to comment on one another, we can informally do the kinds of things that we do sometimes in class discussion when we're asking students for feedback, but we also get a more thorough sample. As Dr. Robinson was talking about, not everybody speaks up in class. But I can see all of their entries. If I ask the same kinds of questions in that formative assessment that I might ask in classrooms to elicit feedback from students, I can gauge how well they understand uh, or you know, what kinds of things they're wrestling with or questions they might have. Also, I read enough of them to direct class conversation. So if somebody never speaks up, I might, hey, Sam, I read in your uh, response post X, Y, and Z. Can you talk more about that? And that sort of gets them going. They've already been discussing it before they get into class and, you know, sort of gets the juices flowing that way. Now, as we move towards summative, I'm always taking all of this stuff in uh, as I'm looking at what students are writing, how their uh, written responses to my questions are changing, and I'm adapting those in sort of a recursive process so that I can, you know, meet student needs as we go. And there's a, a sort of a, you know, I guess growing process for both of us in this discussion uh, or dialogue about the course material, whatever that might be, and, you know, it, it, it sets up a nice conversational uh, relationship with us. And then I'm able to uh, more specifically nail down the kinds of questions that I'm going to give them in formal essays where I'm going to be focused on the product uh, and I'm able to target those in ways that I can really meet the students' needs as I see them come up in these sort of uh, informal formative writing assignments along the way. And so we can use writing for summative purposes. We can use questions to foster synthesis. This again goes back to what Dr. Robinson was talking about, papers that require a knowledge of application. So that they have to actually apply the knowledge that, you, that they've learned to a real world situation. And final, final drafts of paper developed for class. Um, we decided that you might find this helpful because this is something that I actually use with uh, my fresh, when I teach freshman composition, I, I give this to them because often students aren't used to answering essay questions. Um, and I'm not going to belabor this, but if you look under um, answering the an and analyzing the question for the students, it should have the topic, the task, and hints. And this is a well-worded essay question that can get at what it is you're trying to get at. So you can use this as kind of like a model to make sure that you've got all the elements of a well-written essay question. Because like Dr. Robbins said, saying, tell me everything you know about this, that's not, you know, that's not a good question. Okay. So um, the reason you use summative assessment is it allows you to make adjustments at the end of the year. Um, for the next iteration of the course, that's one of the reasons to, you, to look at your summative assessment. And again, if at the end of the day, all of your students had problem on one um, paper assignment, then there was probably something wrong with the assignment, or it wasn't getting at what you wanted it to get at. So when you teach the course again, you can make changes, knowing that this is something that was problematic. It allows students to be assessed on specific course knowledge, it allows the instructor to assess critical thinking, and it allows for the instructor to ensure discipline-specific knowledge has been obtained in a summative way. You're not, they're not, you're not going to make, they're not going to make adjustments to anything, and neither are you other than in the next iteration of the course. Right, and this one we were going to split, I yes. guess. That was the thing. So um, we'll talk about writing portfolios, electronic portfolios is something that I'm really very interested in. Um, but the basic idea behind portfolios is the process of reflection, selection, and presentation. Uh, in order to use reflective portfolios or uh, portfolios for disciplines outside of, say, English, um, you need to understand what counts as reflective practice in that academic discipline. In a chemistry course, an experiment that failed can be a very valuable learning tool if there is a uh, subsequent reflection on the part of the student and uh, a consideration of how that experiment might be approached in a more effective way. Um, you know, same perhaps if we're teaching historical method, uh, each of us have uh, our own disciplines, but in order to use portfolios, once we define reflective practice within that discipline, this enables us to take students really to a more advanced level of understanding of the disciplines that we are teaching. Then they can select those aspects of their work that they feel best represents 
uh, what they've learned over the course of their time with you and present those in such a way um, that enables them to show off, to give you their best work. And ultimately, I find this uh, one of the most effective assessment mechanisms. It is more work um, for the teacher and for the student, but you're getting them a chance to really think about what they've learned and to show off, to give you a chance to uh, give them a chance to demonstrate to you as the audience, hey, you know, this is what I can do. Here's what I understand about historical method. Here's what I understand about physics, whatever. Um, you know, pick your discipline and give them a chance. And electronic portfolios allow for such a wide range in the presentation aspect of this, whether that is uh, images, um, whether they're including fragments of uh, calculus problems and talking about where they ran into problems working it out or how they solved problems, uh, you can get a lot out of them this way. And so, and using these in print, um, say for instance, you're, they have to learn to write lab reports in your discipline, whatever that might be. What you could do is have them keep a portfolio of every single one they've done all semester long so that you ensure that they have to look back at the one, you know, you, we write comments on papers to students, right, even lab reports or whatever our discipline is, and then we get the next paper that's got the exact same problems and they've never bothered to look at the comments <laughs> because they looked at the grade and moved on. So if you get them, force them to keep it in some kind of a portfolio, it forces them to look back. And we're, when we get to the end, um, and so the elements of a writing portfolio Matt kind of addressed. So you can have them put anything in that, any kind of writing they do. It could be you might have them reflect after they get their first paper back, write about what you think went wrong with the paper or what you think went right. It could be lots of different things you could ask them to put in there. But the idea is that when you get to the end, and again there's a, sh uh, a handout in there about the elements of the final paper in a portfolio, is that you have to make sure that you're asking them to go back and look at what they did at the beginning of the semester and look at what they did at the end of the semester and look at their own growth and assess what, where their own problems were, assess where they, they came up with ways to ameliorate problems on their own and with your guidance. So that if you look at that handout on the reflective essay, it's, you have to do this. I mean, if you don't do this, the whole purpose of the portfolio is gone because you're never asking them to critically reflect on their processes, on their thinking, and on their growth as, as a writer in your field. So, you know, we, it's easy for me to think about this in terms of my own, you know, writing uh, because I, we take drafts in, which drafts are, are formative. They're not, you know, we don't put grades on them, we give feedback on them. Uh, you can, we're going to give you a minute, in a few minutes here, we're going to give you a chance to um, uh, th think about how some of these could be used in your own discipline. Do you want to say anything else about that? Yeah. And then, um, I, we already mentioned these essay questions, but, you know, if you're using essay questions, you're usually not using them to see if they have knowledge. You're trying to foster critical thinking. And you know, it's one of the things, especially as a new faculty member, you're probably going to be teaching a general education class in your discipline. And the whole purpose of those courses is for our students to learn to think critically in our fields. Not, you know, they might not become biologists or they might not become English majors, but I want them to look at my, the things that I give them to read and, and to do and to critically reflect on them. Think about, you know, connect with the learning in some real and meaningful way. And often, you know, we can, check to make sure that they are thinking critically by using well-worded essay questions. Um, and then did you ask the guiding questions for electronic discussion boards? Right, well I touched upon that earlier. A lot of, when I design electronic discussion questions and I ask students to comment, you know, respond to my questions or specific prompts and I ask them to respond to each other. Many times I'll make that a requirement. I'll respond to at least two of your peers in this electronic format. I am refining those, as I said, uh, as we go in terms to focus them in the directions that I think are most appropriate for whatever the content is that, that I want them to master uh, by the end of the class or the kinds of problems that I want them to begin thinking about solving. So, okay. Give about two to three minutes and, and just think and jot down some ideas that you might have about how you might use some of these writing strategies in your specific discipline area. And especially if you have a discipline that you think would be difficult to measure this way, I'd like to hear from you. The problem I have is, you know, some people, they write really well 
I'm in a science field, I, I've kind of trained myself to, to be as direct as possible, so, so I don't really learn how to write. Well, in general, I, I took the GRE and I tanked it because I could only come up with two paragraphs for the sentence. But I, I, thought, I felt that I answered the question, and, and I don't know how you get people to write like, write like for full, your full blown essays anymore. But that's well, an excellent. Yeah, I mean, that's I think an excellent point. Yeah. My nephew has his PhD in nuclear uh, chemistry, and he teaches the intro physics course at his college. And the students always get mad because he marks them down for their for their you know their languaging skills. And he told them, "Look, you have to be able to talk and write and communicate effectively through the written word. Important er you know important findings from your discipline." You have to be able to do that because if we don't help students do that, we're limiting their, their choices. They can't go to graduate school. They can't go get a PhD because they don't know how to write in their discipline area. I mean, we in the English department can teach them, you know, how to write full sentences and all those other things, but often I think they think that's, oh, that's something for English. This isn't something I need to worry about. But then, of course, anybody that gets an advanced degree knows if you can't write in your discipline area, you're, 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 <laughs> well, I was I was trying to find a better word since I'm on tape, but uh, yeah. Perhaps on where you were going. In that, in sciences, we, we say everything very um, crisply or tersely. So you answer the question at, at a um, general level. Okay, and I think he he's kind of got knocked down because you didn't elaborate enough. You didn't go into depth, and uh, that's the kind of feedback I guess that that we should be giving. Well, but also, I'm seeing students who, because of the social media, where because of Twitter being X number of sure. letters, you know, and things like that. They're saying things so, so briefly that it's not enough. Well, and because when we write, if we do not keep our audience in mind when we're writing, it's not going to make any sense. And so this would be one of the things that I would tell them. Think about who your audience for this lab report is. Uh, you're not there to explicate things that aren't clear. So if, if a lay person can't read this and understand what you're trying to say, then it needs to be done. And yes, each discipline has its own writing conventions. I mean, my background was in all humanities. And then I got my PhD in education in English ed. And so all of a sudden I switched and my, professor, my research professors hated because he, I always had these participle phrases at the end qualifying and he would cross them out. Why are you saying this? I'm like, well, because in the humanities, we're constantly trying to defend ourselves, right? So we don't, we don't want to say anything where it might be misconstrued. And so, yeah, so, but, it, but again, you know, if you're, if you have facility with writing, it should be, you should be able to make the adjustments appropriate to your discipline. That's so going back to audience, one of my favorite quotes is from Einstein, who said, you don't really understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. And sometimes that's what I'll ask students to do. You know, te as we know, how, um, how much do we learn by teaching? Mm -hmm. Put students in that role as, as teacher. Mm -hmm. They like it. You know, a, a couple of things came up along my mind. My son was in AP Physics. I really don't know enough about physics <laughs> to help him. But I was able to help him by asking questions. Um, and one time we were working through a really difficult problem. And I'm telling him things I know about solving problems. Well, do you look in the index? Maybe we need to look up this term. Do we understand the words? And he's working on it, and he figured it out, really, pretty much on his own. And when he was done, he told me, he, well, he liked Star Trek. He said, I feel like Wesley Crusher. <laughs> and, he, and then he said, I like it better when you don't know the answer. And I thought, that's the kind of learning that I want to tap into. Uh, you know, he was really excited about it. And he had pulled out this quadratic equation from some physics thing really far beyond my understanding of, of how to solve the problem. All I did was ask the questions, right? If you get students to teach or give, even tell them, I want you to explain this to your, your sister or your brother or mom who doesn't know it, it's going to change the way they approach the writing. And it's going to clarify for them what they know or what they think they know in really specific ways. Okay, maybe one more person, somebody out there in the back. I like to give students uh, reflections on things that maybe they disagree with a little bit mm -hmm. so that they have to think more to justify their opinion. So their first reflection paper was on an essay by B.F. Skinner on the ethics of helping people because usually psychology majors tell you they want to help people. That's their first response. 
and he's not all about helping people. So they really have to dig deep to figure out why they agree or disagree with his position. And I get more reflective writing when they disagree with somebody than when they agree and I give them something that they expect. You create cognitive dissonance and then they're going to have to think. The first paper response had to be either agreement or disagreement. The second paper had to be the opposite of, what, of one of his points. The opposite and the other. Because what I wanted them to do is understand that, you know, all ideas have merit and all of ideas have weaknesses. But, the, but for us as scholars, as learners, it's for us to take those ideas and decide where we fall and feel comfortable that we've thought about both sides of the issue and we've come up with our decision. And if you can get them to do that kind of thinking in any of your disciplines, you know, because there's always competing theories, right, or, or ideologies, however you want to, whatever phrase you want to use. And the more we can get students to contend with that and let them write about it, so it has to be reflective. But again, when we're doing those kinds of things, we want to think about how we grade it, right? Do we want, is this a summative activity or is it formative? I mean, sometimes what you can do is if, because you don't have time, is you can give them the grade with feedback and then tell them, you know, if you got below a B, you may revise it to get a grade up to a B. Trying to, you know, build in then this understanding that, well, writing is a process, but that's, a, that's another talk. <laughs> okay, so are there any questions for us? You know, if any of you think of things, uh, Matt and I both are on the, you, you just, you know, on the mail, email system, you can find us. We forgot to put our emails on our, on our thing. Right, we didn't think about you it. You just type our names in the global address book. They'll show up. It's a pleasure to be here to uh, look out and, and see that there's probably my replacement out there so I can go retire now. And uh, it's uh, gratifying, to, I, I think, to be in an industry that is so vital to the growth and development of our civilization, of our country, of our way of life. Uh, now I come, I'm not a lifelong academic in the formal sense. I spent about 40 years in corporate America as a, uh, as a corporate executive and I've been full-time uh, in academia for about three years. I, I've been an, an adjunct professor for many more years than that. So uh, I bring a slightly different perspective to things. Uh, uh, along, along the way. And what I'd like to talk about today for just a few minutes and, and give you some insights from my experience is this whole idea of uh, online assessment and testing that goes hand in hand with our move toward online teaching. Now, uh, I'd first like to talk a little bit about the challenges we face as we move into the modern era. There's a wonderful book written uh, a few few years ago called Nine Shift. And Nine Shift is written by a scholar who looks at the, he looks at two different phenomena. One is the introduction of the automobile in the early 1900s. And if you look, if you look at the world in the 1900s before the automobile became popular, and you look at it in the 1950s, let's say, what changes happened, in particular in the United States, what changes occurred in society based on just that one technology? And it's massive if you think of interstate highways, if you think about drive-ins, if you think about uh, all the different things that, that automobiles uh, provided. If you go to Europe and, and spend much time in Europe, you'll learn that in a lot of places where you're born is where your ancestors were born. You might live in the same house as your great, 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 great grandparents. The introduction of the automobile in this country allowed us to move away from family and go explore different things. And, and as a result, we're a very dispersed society. Nine Shift makes the point that the internet is going to have that same kind of impact in the 21st century, that everything is going to change. So talk about some of those challenges that we face as educators. Um, in my, my mind, my simple mind, this is the very best opportunity for education, is in a room with the people you're, you're training and, and educating. Uh, you can interact. There's a lot of benefits to that. The problem is I can only reach the people that are nearby. I can only reach those people who are uh, either on campus or can get to campus. I can't reach people in Western Virginia. I have students currently in Moscow. Uh, our department had a student in uh, 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 Islamabad uh, a couple of semesters ago. Wouldn't have been able to get the same education if we hadn't had the technology. 
So I want to look a little bit at some of the challenges. I'll talk a little bit about some of the perceived, uh, my perceived uh, benefits that I get from online assessment. And like anything, uh, like the automobile or the internet, there are drawbacks. And, and then uh, I'll try to summarize it. What are some of the challenges? Well, the, the first thing is technology. If you can think back 15 years uh, in, in the mid-90s, before the internet was pervasive, uh, how did you order from Sears and Roebuck? You would call them up, you would read, get the catalog, you might, you might send it in or you might call them or something of that nature. Now, and this is a great boon for us introverts, I never have to call anybody anymore. I can just <laughs> go online, I don't have to actually talk to people. Uh, I hate spelling my name because uh, I know how to spell it and when they say can you spell that you know it just annoys me that's an introverted issue uh, <laughs> but we we are facing uh, many many different challenges with cyberspace the, the very everything in the world is moving to cyberspace even war uh, we even fight wars using uh, cyberspace and using Twitter and all these social media there are revolutions now that take place in countries that have oppressive governments and they're using technology, they're using Twitter, they're using Facebook. Uh, we never envisioned those. So the law of unintended consequences says any technology is going to give you effects that you didn't expect. Cyberspace is here to stay. We're having problems every day. There's viruses and hacking. Uh, we're always going to have that, but you had problems before. Second issue when we combine it with uh, the cyberspace is we're facing generational differences which are profound. Wonderful book uh, work, written by Warren Bennis four or five years ago called Geeks and Geezers compared, uh, did in-depth in -depth analysis of people that were born during the Depression and com looked at their values, what, what drives them, uh, what's important to them. My mother was one of those. Uh, when I, when my mother would talk about some of my cousins and, and I remember one day, um, she was, we had a conversation, she said, your cousin Brenda just got a really good job. And I said, really, where is she working? She says, well, she's going to be a security guard at Kmart. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked about cognitive dissonance before. That didn't work for me, security guard at, at Kmart. So I said to my mother, uh, what's your definition of a good job? And she said, steady work and a steady paycheck. She was, she was raised during the Depression. Uh, on a, on a very small farm in Arlington, Virginia. Now they, they, they raised chickens and they, they grew their own food and things of that nature, but still life was tough. And the idea that you could get somebody to pay you and all you had to do was uh, work in a, in a stultifying job for eight or 10 hours a day, that was a pretty good bargain. If, if you were to ask uh, a, a 18 or 20 year old today, what's your idea of a good job? I want something that's got a challenge in it. I want something that I'm going to learn and grow. And pay is Im important, but not, not a critical factor. So we've got generational issues. My generation, the baby boomers, we kind of fit in between those two, uh, the, those, those two paradigms, I think, on the ends of those spectrum, the, the spectrum. Uh, we are very materialistic and we're very uh, uh, goal-driven, so when, um, I'm going to tell a story on myself, I probably shouldn't, but when I went through my undergraduate days, we actually did have technology, they were called tape recorders, and I would tape record the, uh, the professor's lectures and I would play them back and compare them to my notes to make sure I didn't miss anything because I was so achievement oriented. I was also on the GI Bill at the time and they wouldn't pay you for anything uh, less than a B, so I knew how to get an A, I didn't know how to get a B. So I went, but, but that kind of thinking that, that it is very different. I see today's generations, uh, the millennials, uh, the ex-gens to some extent, have a much more holistic approach to life. Uh, they want to enjoy life, not when they're 50 and retiring or 65 and retiring. They want to enjoy it now. Uh, they ask more questions. I think they're more intelligent than my generation. Uh, so I think that's, Im that's an important thing to take in mind. They, you also deal with them and address them very differently. Uh, I, I can't imagine trying to lecture to a group of millennials for three hours with maybe just some comfort breaks. I mean, that would just wouldn't go over. Uh, and, and so, as you see, the, I, I kind of structure my, uh, my presentations to the point where I don't have a lot of dense words. I've got some stories to tell, and it seems to kind of keep their interest. The other issue that we're facing and will continue to face 
is there's a lot of competition in this industry from the online uh, for-profit type educators. You can go to a place like University of Phoenix online. They have a fine education. It's accredited. It's, it's as good as any. It's very, very expensive. But they're almost completely online. They do have some sites. So uh, we're looking at where where is this thing going? We're going from bricks and mortar to clicks and mortar. And at some point in the future, we're going to need a lot less of the mortar and a lot more of the clicks. Now, our department has, for the last year, been experimenting with getting as much content online as we possibly can. With that comes what I consider to be the scourge of education, which is testing and assessment. I don't like grades. I think they're counterproductive. Um, you're taping this, aren't you? Uh, except at Old Dominion, where they're really done right. Now, now, I've done a tremendous amount of research in, in the area of human motivation and dynamics, and it turns out uh, some of the leading researchers like Edward Dietschy have, have clearly made the point that uh, when, that people are a lot more creative and a, and a lot more uh, knowledgeable when you don't put a grade in front of them. However, it's as uh, Churchill said about democracy, it's the worst of all political systems except for all the rest. I don't know how you would assess people uh, because there's going to be about 30% of your students when you go through a lifetime of teaching, about 30% who are just there for a grade. And, and if you don't grade them, then they're not going to pay attention. There won't be any knowledge transfer. So we've got all these things that are facing us, these environmental challenges. And uh, when you're in the online environment, uh, we use Adobe, we're using Adobe Connect right now. It's a fine tool. We've gotten it very, uh, very well refined so that it works as, uh, as it should. I can see the students if they have a camera. I can talk to them. I can, I can do the same things I'm doing here. The only difference is they're very small in that window. They're not real life size. Uh, so there's a lot we can do uh, with Adobe Connect. The problem comes in testing. How do you test the, the, and assess their retention of knowledge, uh, their, their interest, and things of that nature? So let me talk about a few, a few of the things uh, that we have attempted and, and, and done well, and then I'll talk about some of the, the pitfalls and we can maybe get some interaction here. First of all, there's testing. Uh, testing seems to be required, especially in the engineering college where I'm from. Uh, if you teach somebody um, the fundamentals of engineering economics, then you want to make sure that they can solve a problem in engineering economics. Uh, quizzes to kind of get them motivated into understanding uh, the material. Uh, surveys. I use surveys quite a bit to uh, to get opinions from the students about topical items, about things of that nature. Uh, we've talked a lot about journals. One of the things that I require from all of my students is a journal, a weekly journal entry. Uh, now, these are engineering students. They don't like to write very much. I also require a research paper at the end of end of each uh, semester to test their knowledge, to to test their ability to research but also to get them to write. Because I think one of the, the key elements that's going to determine the successful engineer of the future is can they communicate? It's, it's not how brilliant their ideas are. Now I came from about 25 years of supporting NASA and I can tell you in my years as an executive supporting NASA, we didn't always implement the best idea. We always implemented the best idea that was persuasively presented both in writing and in a presentation. One of the worst things that, that occurs in the engineering environment is you have these brilliant people who just don't want to communicate with the rest of the world. And they're, sometimes their opinion is, if you're not smart enough to see the wisdom and brilliance of my work, then I don't want you to have it, you know? And unfortunately, you see, you tend to see that attitude sometimes. So one of the things that uh, I was speaking with one of the senior executives at NASA when I was at the Johnson Space Center, and I said, what's your biggest issue? And he says, my biggest issue is I can't always implement the best ideas because some of these people just don't want to talk. I had a personal um, sort of a mentor who was one of the um, legends of the Johnson Space Center. Uh, this fellow designed and built things like modems. Uh, the, he, he designed and built a box that would communicate with the space shuttle. Very complex technology. But he hated to speak in public and didn't like to talk to anybody he didn't know really well. 
So I became famous by just being his interpreter. I'd take his <laughs> his technical knowledge, and, and we'd go to a design meeting, and he'd, he'd whisper in my ear you know, for 30 minutes, and I would say, it won't work. Billy Bob said it won't work, so it won't work. Um, so, he, so we had some real difficulties there. Uh, I really believe strongly in, in writing and, and expression, and, and one of the reasons I use journals and, and writing assignments so, uh, so extensively is because I think engineers in particular need to do a better job of, of, of being able to express themselves. Now, m most of the engineers start out and they, ha they would rather take a beating or get a root canal than do that weekly journal, and by the time we get through a semester, most of them, n many of them, no, some of them, um, say that it was really good experience and they'll keep doing it because it's it's the the reflective nature of journaling uh, is something they may not have done before. The final kind of area that I like to use online assessments for, and this has changed over the years to make it a lot easier. I don't know how 30 years ago a professor knew whether a paper was plagiarized or not. I guess if, if you've got a student that's carving it out of stone, you know, the really brutal writing and they present this paper that's brilliant, that might be a clue, but that's probably not the case uh, often. I use tools uh, like SafeAssign and others. Uh, now, the problem with SafeAssign is it's, it's, a, it's comprehensive, but it's stupid. It, it, it may actually highlight things that aren't plagiarism, but it does give the, the students uh, a sense of uh, this might be an issue and I need to go look at it. I am astounded at how few students really understand what plagiarism is. And so what I've done in every class I teach now, I have a, a, at least one session where I show them how to use the library and I show them what plagiarism is. And I'm astounded that they don't seem to know what that is. Uh, but uh, with the plagiarism, most of the plagiarism I see is unintentional. Now, I have had, I did have one student when I was teaching at George Washington, and he wrote this just brilliant 30-page paper. It was a graduate course. It was really, really brilliant. Apparently, he had downloaded it from the internet, and the only thing he changed was the name, put his in there. So we called him in. I got with the department chair. We called him in and said, you know, is this your work? Yeah. Well, it looks very similar to a paper that was published two years ago. Do you, are you using a different name here, or you know, what are you doing? Uh, and he finally admitted that it was plagiarism. But that's pretty rare that people actually um, uh, will engage in that behavior. Now, I'm not saying that people don't buy uh, essays. You can even buy a dissertation. Uh, but that, that kind of behavior is somewhat rare, I think. Now, maybe I'm fooling myself. Uh, that, that's possible. So some of the benefits of uh, online assessment, we talked about that earlier. It is a lot easier to use for both you and the student. You, it, the student, I, I use exclusively online testing and I have used it exclusively since I've been at ODU and actually when I was at teaching at other places like George Washington. Uh, and it's so much easier for me and the students. It's easier for me because it's easy to write and administer an online test. Uh, I'm not talking about the guidelines, I'm talking about actually the, the infrastructure and the implementation. Uh, the idea, every test I give has essay questions in it. The idea of trying to read people's handwritings, if you had them in class, is something that, I did that when I was an undergraduate, I can't imagine doing that to, to, today. So it really, does, it really does make it much easier to administer. Uh, I think it, it gives you a lot more control over your environment to some extent, uh, and you lose control in other areas that I'll talk about in a minute. It's very efficient. It, you talk about multiple choice, you, I, I never grade multiple choices anymore. What I do is I spend the time instead of grading them because Blackboard does that automatically, I go look at the statistics of each question and if I see that everybody missed question five, I go back and look at it and maybe it's just the opposite of what I intended and I'll fix that. The other nice thing is I can get remote participation from people who they're not on campus. Uh, I don't have to have proctors. I don't have to worry about making copies. It's all there in Blackboard or Moodle or whatever the, the application is. I can give much quicker feedback and reinforcement with an online tool than I could going through papers and, and writing them. And there's probably lots of other benefits too that I'm not talking about here, but the, the benefits here tend to be more in the uh, in the infrastructure, if you want to think of it that way. It's in, 
the other benefit that, that, that I really like about Blackboard is if people email me things, I'm going to lose them. Blackboard, if they use Blackboard exclusively uh, for collection of assignments, a collection of assessments, things of that nature, you're not going to lose anything. It's right there in Blackboard. So those are some of the benefits. Where do we lose something? And in any, any technology, any introduction of an idea where you're replacing one idea with another, there's always going to be some loss. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you there's not some significant loss in, in when you go to online assessment. One is, if I'm giving an in-class exam, I can look at the paralanguage, I can look at the body language, I can listen to, when, listen to what students are, are saying if they're asking questions. I can see if a student is really struggling with a problem and I can go over and maybe help that student. That, that is very difficult, if not impossible, to assess in, a, in, a, uh, in an online environment. Some students, I have found, some people, have test anxiety. They know the material really cold, but when you put them in a test environment, they really freeze. This kind of exacerbates that kind of a situation. And you're not there in person to maybe relieve some of the anxiety and, and tell them you really do know this stuff. Uh, I was preparing a student about four or five years ago for a certification exam. And I, I would tutor him and mentor him. And, and at the end of uh, the first session, he said, well, I'm not very good at taking tests. And I realized that that very mentality is probably what's going to cause him to fail. The idea that you think you're not good at a test, you see something you know the answer to, uh, but you doubt it. So I had him uh, go around and uh, chant to himself on a regular basis, I'm really good at test taker, I'm a really good test taker. And he passed, so I don't know if it worked or not, but you know, there's something to be said. Uh, the next issue is kind of sensitive, but the research tells us that cheating is at epidemic proportions. Uh, I don't believe it just began to be at epidemic proportion, uh, proportions. I believe that we're just discovering uh, how pervasive cheating is, and I think it's always been that way. And I think the more pressure you put on students to achieve, I think the more cheating you tend to get. I had a very interesting experience when I first came to ODU. I was giving all my tests online. Uh, in the second semester of teaching a course, which was a math course, um, I, uh, I, would, I would put the formula question in. You know, I hear, hear, I'd give them a, like a word question and say, what's the answer, and show your work. Now, I had taken the exam from the last semester, and I had changed the parameters. And when I put the question in, a particular question in, I put the question in with the changed parameters, but I put the answer in with different parameters. So the answer was really wrong, and you couldn't get where I, you couldn't get that answer based based on the question that I had. So I gave the exam, and I gave four hours for the exam, and I noticed a couple of people kind of signed in really late to do their exam. Uh, now you can prevent that with things like Respondus or some of the tools, but I began to look at these three students, and they all had the wrong answer, and they all got to the exact same wrong answer. Uh, the the wrong way. In other words, you couldn't. It, it was that. And they. I even looked at their inserts, and there were no formulas. They had just copied the wrong answer. So I got him in and talked to him, and they denied it. And then later they broke into tears and said, "I cheated, and I'm awful, and I won't do it again." There is cheating that goes on. If you've ever given anything out in class, that's a test, and you've let it, let it go uh, with a student, it's somewhere. In the, in the environs of Norfolk or somebody floating around and some student association or group of people has it and they're studying you. You can even go online and find, you can find tests that, that teachers have given. So you've got to be aware of that. And it's a, it's a lot more difficult to monitor that uh, in online a, a testing and assessment than it is if you're giving a, a, a test in class. You lose a lot of the interactivity uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, getting a back and forth is, is a, little more diff a little bit more difficult in the online environment than it is uh, live. Uh, and finally, you don't have the kind of, you have some limitations on the kinds of assessments you can really do. Uh, I think the Socratic method of teaching is really good, where you walk around, you pose questions, you get people, as Jack mentioned, uh, when you throw a question out and 30 minutes later you get back into the discussion because the, 
the students are having such a good discussion, that is really a good uh, assessment technique. It's a good learning technique. It's a little bit more difficult online because uh, the, of the, n the nature of online, the nature of assessment. All in all, though, whether we like it or not, uh, it's like the weather. You might not like it, but it's going to be what it is. Uh, we're headed in this direction, and uh, if, if we don't go back to the challenges, if we don't uh, address the online education part of our curriculum, uh, we're going to get left behind because there are going to be people that are come in and compete with us and, and, and take away uh, our domain if we're not careful. So, Any questions on anything I've had to say? Or anything? Open it up if anyone has any questions either for uh, Mr. Daniels or, or Dr. Robinson. How much do you have to know about web design in to actually put together an online course? Zero. <laughs> Zero. How much do you have to know about web design? You have to know zero about web design. Uh, if you, it, let me qualify that. If you use the right tool, if you use a, a tool like Blackboard, which we have at OU, or Moodle, or there's two or three others, um, essentially you need to know how to use the internet because it's very, very much an internet application. If you, there are some tricks you need to understand in, um, in Blackboard as to how to upload a test or create a test tool. That sort of thing, but they're pretty easy to learn. So it's if you can type and you can use the internet, it's, it's pretty. Easy. Now, does it, does Blackboard explain things well? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, but you can get there, and we have a great technology staff. Uh, if you ever have a question, give one of them a call. They're really, really good at that. So you don't you don't really have to know very much about it at all. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Students need to uh, give their homeworks using some online system and for some problems I asked them to show their work how yeah. they solve the problem and I got response from my students uh, that it's very difficult at some times for them to write basically in this online environment most of the cases if it's coming to sketch something to use that to solve all the problem they don't know how to do that well using this system or um, they are like use, uh, they are spending a lot of time struggling on how to write this idea using this online system if they would just spend this time on thinking on their problem how to solve it so in that case i don't know which uh, method is more useful for them to give that uh, as a paper based work or to push them to do this online system and uh, i don't know figure out how they mm -hmm. can basically uh, send their disinformation to me through this uh, limited way of uh, showing their work. What do you think? I remember when I was an undergraduate, um, I tried to use those techniques too. Um, and I would tell my teachers, you know, writing this stuff down with a pen and pa paper is so much harder than uh, you just trust that I know the knowledge. So <laughs> students will game you. These are the same students that are telling you they can't use the technology, that are tweeting, they're using Facebook, they're writing, we have 13 year olds writing games and they become mil billionaires. So I'm not very sympathetic to that. If they can write it down on a piece of paper, mm -hmm. then they can find a scanner somewhere, they can upload that into Blackboard as, as a file, just like they would send it through the email. If they use um, something like Microsoft Word, Microsoft Word has all the formulas, math formulas you would ever need, has all the Greek, I mean, they can learn how to use that. Uh, so you, I find a, very, a, a percentage of students who simply are here at the university with the sole objective not to really learn anything. <laughs> uh, and if you push them, they're going to push back and say, well, I don't want to use that next technology. Um, now, what I, I do the same thing with any problem where there's uh, math or anything involved in it, I ask the students to show their work because I want to give them credit. If, if they made a, a math error, I want to give them credit. So they can, you can, in Blackboard, you can upload uh, spreadsheets, Word documents, PDF, text documents. So that's a weak excuse. It's because they don't go to the library to look at books anymore. Um, they actually do their research online. And so um, in the first week of class, I take them to the computer lab and I show them how to log into Blackboard, 
because all of their assignments and all of our course documents are in Blackboard. So at that point, after that lab, there's no excuse, you know, after the first week of school for them to not be able to get into Blackboard. But that way, they've got an assignment where I've been able to show them this is how you do it, and then they've been able to prove to me and get a little credit for it that they know how to, to do that kind of thing. And then when we do wikis, their research projects, their semester research project is a wiki. I don't collect written reports. So they actually do this whole wiki thing, and, and instead of doing like a massive class on wiki, we do a little bit along and along. Here's how to get into it and access it. We do that in one of the lab sessions. And then the next time, here's how to link pages to each other and do external links. And so you can actually have them do an entire like 10, 13, 15 page research paper in a wiki. And you can have them do it as a group. And with the discussion boards and the blogs that exist in Blackboard, they don't ever have to meet in person as a group to get a group project done. So that gets rid of the whining and complaining about, well, my group members can't meet when I can, and you know, one lives in Portsmouth and the other in Chesapeake. So it takes care of a lot of that using the, the technology, but it does take some effort in the beginning to make sure that they don't have any excuses for why they can't get stuff done. One thing I've used, and I'm a recently retired 30-year high school teacher, is YouTube. Mm -hmm. Almost any technology you need to learn to use or upload or do anything, and I'm being forced to learn APA after 20 some years and having never seen it before. There are YouTube videos at basic levels that will teach anybody anything, including how to upload figures, how to do anything. So I have always put in any math, basic chemistry thing that you need extra help on, there is a YouTube video waiting for you. <laughs> That's, a, th that's an interesting point. That's one of the reasons uh, we had one of our faculty member, uh, uh, an, ass an assistant professor, who kind of bought up the whole YouTube thing. And he, and he was saying, I don't need to spend um, a lot of uh, class time explaining derivatives. I can just point, th I can just point them. Well, it's not a math class. It's a, it's oh, a, it's a, a you're math. supposed to have had calculus before you come to this well, class. I, I found a fabulous uh, online uh, YouTube by Daniel Pink, an author who writes about motivation. And it, it, not only was it a cool video, the implementation of the video was really cool. And what they did was they took a guy and he would draw, he would talk and draw at the same time, but it was sped up. So you saw, so you got not only the, 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 the uh, visual learners, but you got the people who learn uh, by listening, and you, and you got all of that, and the, the students really loved it, so I try to incorporate as much of that as I can, but you make a very, very good point. Never take anything for granted. I talked about the millennials and how good they are with technology. That's not true with all of them. So what I have learned, if you ever are in one of my classes, uh, you're going to be faced with a 13-page syllabus, minimum. <laughs> I mean, the reason is, I've gotten so many questions over the years, I want to get to the real content. I don't want to spend my time answering questions about when is the midterm due. You know. is, is your syllabus searchable? It is. It, it's absolutely. Uh, and, and, I, and the same thing is true. I provide them. I give them that student introduction is the first thing you need to do and upload. And I have one or two points. You know, it's a very small thing. But, um, at the beginning of each semester, I write out a little message and save it in Word that says, please do not send any assignments in email because I will lose them and you won't get credit. If you're having trouble, call the help desk at this one. And I, I just leave it on my desktop. I brief them in the first night and tell them, do not send me your assignments in email. The first assignment that's due, I get two or three emails that said, I'm attaching my assignment because Blackboard was down. So all I have to do is cut and paste that message and send it back to them. And I don't have to retype it 30 times for some. About the fourth session, everybody gets it. And they're comfortable. Questions. I know we're getting a little bit late, so um, anything? Any last comments? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.